And welcome, fellow unemployables, to this week's edition of Seven Figure Small, the show that provides creative freelancers and entrepreneurs like you with compelling stories and actionable strategies for living the seven figure small lifestyle. This is our 188th episode overall, and it's the ninth episode of Seven Figure Small Live, where we broadcast our recording with a live audience of Unemployable Initiative members and some Twitter onlookers as well. So welcome to all of you who are here live. I'm your host, Jared Morris, partner and community leader here at Unemployable. And to begin the proceedings here today, let me introduce my co-host. He is my partner at Unemployable and my co-host here on Seven Figure Small. You know him as a serial digital entrepreneur who has started a handful of seven-figure and eight-figure businesses. He's a writer, a curator, a traveler, and now a Twitter comedian, apparently. His latest material, what's the internal temperature of a tauntaun? Lukewarm. <laughs> That's very funny. He is Brian Clark. Brian, what's on your mind this week? <laughs> Twitter comedian. My wife told me that joke, so <laughs> she gets the. Uh, I, I really did think it was bad, but people liked it. So, anyway, uh, speaking of Twitter, I keep dwelling on this comment from a few weeks back where someone said, I sound exactly like James Spader. And I, oh. I don't hear it. I'm a James Spader fan, and I do not think I sound like him. So, we're going to put it out to the audience, and I'm going to do some uh, Spader lines from his uh, most famous characters, and we're going to see. This is not a James Spader impersonation, will you? Because I wouldn't even dare go there. If I sound like him, then I'll just read this, and then you'll decide, right? Okay. So Spader was like the sleazy D-bag in the 80s as Steph in Pretty in Pink, speaking to Andrew McCarthy's Blaine. And he said, I've seen your mother go to work on you, Blaine. It's vicious. When Bill and Joyce are through with you, you won't know whether to shit or go sailing. Listen, I'm really bored with this conversation. All right, Blaine. All right. Then we have, we have Robert Downey Jr.'s drug dealer in Lesson Zero rip to Downey Jr.'s uh, Julian. And here's this line. I don't want to trust you, Julian. I just want my 50K. All right. And then, of course, we've got the classic repairing of Robert Downey Jr. and Spader in Age of Ultron. Instead of a crack boy, he's Iron Man facing off against his own creation. Uh, Spader in a deadpan and, dare I say, robotic performance. Where's the drum? Oh God. Okay. Damn. <laughs> Wait, what what did you need? I said robotic performance. See, Ultron is a robot. Mm. See, that was okay. Yeah. All right. uh, no sound effects. I, I can't even get a sound effect. I wasn't prepared for this. <laughs> no, of course not. <laughs> That's what happens when you ask me what's on my mind without knowing. Okay, here we go. So Tony Stark says, what's with the vibranium? And Ultron says, I'm glad you asked that because I wanted to take this time to explain my evil plan. All right. It's up to you people at Brian Clark on Twitter, Spader or not Spader. I'm still going with not Spader, but it's up to you. I'm in your hands. Can I just say as the producer of the show who likes to take audio out of context and use it later? Can we make this a segment on every show? Because this is this is wonderful. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm going to regret this. <laughs> I, I understand that. Uh, okay, well, that's a good, that is a great start to this episode. All right, and now to my right, he is one of the pioneers of the seven figure small lifestyle that we talk about on this show with his 2020 book, Company of One serving as an inspiration for many people who decided that staying small was the way to achieve big goals in their own lives. He is also one of the founders and instructors at Creative Class, which helps freelancers run their businesses better. Oh, and in addition to all that, he's revolutionizing website analytics around privacy and simplicity with Fathom Analytics, all while growing his own asparagus and baking delicious cinnamon rolls from scratch. He is Paul Jarvis. Paul, welcome to Seven Figure Small Live. It is great to have you. Let's start out as we always do. What is the most unemployable thing about you? 
probably the the finger tattoos i guess <laughs> i don't know <laughs> that was the answer he gave the first time he yeah, was on the show exactly of I course it's recycling hey this is a fun fact paul has regained uh the honor of being the most often appearing guest yes. although hey. You know, we change show names like he changes business models, but you know, it, it's all one thing, really. <laughs> Paul, do you have any impressions that you brought to us that you would like to begin the show with? I am, I'm awful, awful at impressions. <laughs> I can't, I can't even impersonate myself most of the time. If I have to redo audio for things, I'm like, how did I sound like that? <laughs> do people ever say you sound or look like someone? Because I get that all the time. I'm just like. Uh, I don't know. Not really. No, I don't think so. You're an original. Yeah, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> All righty. Well, here is what we have on tap this week in Seven Figure Small Live. We're going to start with some headlines, as we always do, and then we will dive into our main topic, how you can build a personal enterprise without obsessing over your personal brand. Heck, even ditching your personal brand. And then finally, we will end with some Q&A. Had a couple of really good questions submitted ahead of time. So we'll get to those, answer some questions live. All that coming here on this week's edition of Seven Figure Small Live. But let's start with headlines. And we have two of them this week. And let's begin, guys, with Basecamp, which has been embroiled in quite a bit of controversy over the last week. So let me quickly get everyone up to speed, just in case you haven't been keeping up with this. So it started with founders Jason Fried and David Hennemeyer Hansen announcing that Basecamp would no longer be posting any, quote, societal and political discussions on their company's social media accounts, nor allowing such discussions internally. In defending the move in separate written statements, they used almost the exact same sentence, quote, you shouldn't have to wonder if staying out of it means you're complicit or stepping into it means you're a target, unquote. They also pledged to end paternalistic benefits, as they termed them. This was followed by several handfuls of employees accepting buyouts from the company and subsequent reporting by Casey Newton at The Verge suggests that the free DHH announcement was precipitated by an internal controversy over a long running list of kind of, quote, funny customer names that some employees found amusing, but others were mortified by. The founders had known about the list for years and reportedly grew exasperated that they couldn't acknowledge the situation as a failure and then move on, which kind of led to this decision. So, Brian and Paul, you have both been outspoken on Twitter about this situation. So I want to talk about it a bit here. And Brian, I'll start with you. What do you make of all this? What a disaster. I mean, you know, these are guys that I, you know, about 15 years ago when there were 37 signals, I kind of admired and looked up to and mainly because they were doing software and I thought that was something I couldn't do. And then I ended up doing that. Um, but over time, they got like super preachy about how to run a company and this and that. And I'm like, you know, I agree with most of what they say, but the danger of doing that is when it all falls apart in just like a self-own. But, you know, Casey Newton has done some great reporting on this. So I encourage everyone to read up on his work if you're interested. But it really seems to boil down to, yes, customer support would make note of funny customer names, generally based on their race or ethnicity, which is not very funny. Um, but it also turns out that one of the earliest base camp uh, employees that's been there since the beginning and is and it was an executive with the company is kind of a is kind of on the right wing side and kind of a white supremacist apologist, I, I don't know, or a denier, I guess would be a better word. And that's really where, if you read between the lines, that the rest of the company didn't like this guy, but the two founders protected him and they lost a third of the company over, including him. Wouldn't it have been better just to let that dude go and keep your head of customer support, your head of marketing, your head of design, your head of iOS? Oh my gosh. Uh, you know, and people who think this was a publicity stunt because they're famous for it. You don't walk back this as a publicity stunt. They are in serious trouble. And I'm not gloating, but I'm just scratching my head. They seem to be smarter than this. And it just spun right out of control. Paul? And he, the guy that they were protecting left anyways. So. Right. <laughs> I mean, I think that this is 
I, I just think that they their, their history shows us that this is something that could obviously have happened, although it was something that we didn't see happening, right? Where they are, they've made a living being very, very opinionated and having opinions that they don't really, they, and, and I guess what kind of bugs me about all of this is I, it's not about politics at work. It has nothing to do with that. It, it has to do with the fact that people at the company that, that base camp and hey had an issue and were uncomfortable about something and instead of jason and dhh sharing in that discomfort and holding space for these people to to talk about it and try to work through problems they first posted a blog post about it to let the in public to let their employees know what the policies were but two when i guess they they released the policies um, at the same time as they disbanded all the internal committees including the diversity inclusion and equity committee that i think 20% of the company or something like a, a big part of the company wanted to be part of because they felt that this was really important. They disbanded all of that at the same time and they just, they dug their heels in and I was like, okay, this is like, this is a bad take you guys. And then I was like, okay, well maybe they, maybe they'll make it better. Like maybe they'll see the error in their ways and, and, and listen to their employees and make it better. That didn't happen. I mean, DHH was in bed um, with his camera off the whole time for that all hands meeting that just went to shit. And I feel like I just I feel so bad. Like I feel bad for the people. I feel doing customer support is hard when things are going good. I know because I've done customer support for for a long time, first as a job and now as a business owner. But when things are going bad and you have to do customer support, you're the one who didn't make this decision, but you're the one who's having to deal with this all day. And yeah, I just think putting the the comfort of a few in the suppression of comfort for others just isn't a way like ignoring something or saying, let's not ever talk about this again, just doesn't solve anything like business as a relationship, right? It's not like a, a marriage, but in some ways it kind of is because you're working with this person, you have to deal with them and just like, let's just ignore the problem. Like, how does that, like, how does that solve anything? I just, I... I don't know. And we just had DHH on my podcast as well last week. And I'm like, this is just, this is just not good. Like this is, I even have a, Hey, t like I bought the fucking Hey t-shirt as well. <laughs> Sorry, I don't know if I'm allowed to swear, but like, it's fun. Uh, it's just, I just, I don't know. James I, Spader started it. So you're, you're yeah. fine. <laughs> I just think that I'm not surprised that this happened, but I am at the same time where they've just made such a point of being overly political and speaking out on social issues. And that's kind of I'm like, okay, this is cool. Like this is an example of a company who can do these sorts of things um, and, and do them with the, with the deafness and nuance that's required when dealing with these topics. Cause these topics aren't easy to talk about. Nobody said that they were, but like, it just, I don't know. It just, it, it, it has made me, yeah, unhappy about this, but also, I just like I it's I don't know how and it's funny too because in, in talking to DHH last week he was like I kind of wish the company was smaller and I'm like a third of them just quit so you kind of got your wish but like, yeah wish, wish granted <laughs> it's I can't imagine I don't think like I was thinking about this too like okay if, if I was in this position and I had a company of 60 people how would I have dealt with this obviously differently but I just think I don't have the skill set or abilities, and I don't think they do either, to manage a large group of people. They're programmers and developers and designers. Like their background isn't in human resources or in, in managing people or in facilitating with people, right? And so I think they may be really good at the job they do, but they've been given this job by virtue of they've grown the company and now they're at the top of it. And Basecamp and Hay, I guess, exist at the whim of both of them. But I don't I don't know. I don't think they're I don't think they're qualified to manage people in a company that size. Just like I because I was thinking about it from my perspective, I wouldn't be I wouldn't be qualified to manage a company of, of 60 people. Well, we got to 65 people and I realized the same damn thing. So here we are. No employees, <laughs> no investors. <laughs> All of a sudden, this is getting more attractive, yes. regardless of how you feel about the particular issues here. But it, it really is stunning to see. I'm, I'm with Paul. I just shocked. I, I thought they could, had more savvy about people, you know, because they were very good at I don't want to say manipulating, but playing the audience with their pick a fight 
you know, strategy and all this kind of stuff. So they understand human psychology, but when it came to their own people, you put out a blog post instead of an internal memo first. I mean, how would you feel, Jared, like back in the day, if I announced that you couldn't do something by a blog post? I mean, that just wouldn't happen. Yeah, I'd have been like, where's my four-word email? That's what I'm expecting here. Come exactly. On. That's Stop how you do that. it. <laughs> Terse emails. That's what you do. There's also uh, the issue of privacy too, right? Where if they're sharing a bunch of customer details with everybody internally who might not have access to that. I got I canceled my Basecamp account and my hack like I don't trust them any longer. They don't trust mm-hmm. their employees, obviously, which is what this um which is what this thing basically means and I don't I don't trust them. So Man, see, that's an interesting point on this, Paul. And I'm curious to get your guys' thoughts because, you know, it's one thing of how this is viewed by the employees and people are leaving and their business. I mean, it's just such upheaval. But it's also now how are customers going to view this? Because we don't live in a world anymore where you can just kind of sit under a rock and pretend this stuff isn't going to happen. I had the same reaction. As soon as this came out, I'm like, man, I really like, hey, but do I still want to keep my email with them? If you know, like political it makes to, you, to yeah, have a hey like email. you immediately kind of ask that question of yourself. And I haven't canceled or done anything yet. I kind of want to think about it more. But it's amazing that those are the questions that are going to go through people's heads. So what is there a lesson or what is the lesson that can be taken, you know, here about, you know, how you need to operate and handle these issues in 2021? Making space to listen, maybe. Yeah. Like making making a bad call is one thing, but making a bad call, learning why it's potentially bad or why it actually is bad, and then not doing anything differently, I think is the issue. Because none of us are perfect. We all make mistakes. And that's not the issue. It's not the, the, the woke police aren't coming after them kind of thing. But it's just like if you are going to do something that affects other people and then you understand how that has negatively affected other people and you still don't do anything about it, it's like, okay, well, that seems kind of worse. And that, yeah, I did cancel my Hey account because of it. And you had that sweet Paul. Oh, wait, I'm not, I was about to announce your email address, yeah. but if you did cancel it. <laughs> but no, the forward kinda, stays forever. Yeah, uh, <laughs> that's right. Oh, good. <laughs> because, uh, yeah, I've kind of been, I got over my excitement over Hey. So I wasn't going to keep going with it anyway, but this made it kind of easy. So, um, but one thing about it, you know, I, I think they, Jason knew there's no such thing as internal and external in modern business, but his, his attempt to get ahead of it by posting publicly is just so wrongheaded. I still can't get over it. I mean, it just was a disastrous uh, idea. And then the apology that came out, I guess it was maybe today. I don't know. I think Paul commented on it. That's how I yes, saw today. it. Yeah, oh, yes, I haven't today. seen the apology today. yet. Okay. But it, it's a sorry, not sorry. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, I mean, so whatever. Uh, uh, one less group of people to pay attention to. That's okay. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, let's move on now to our second headline. And this one comes to us from CNN. And it's called Silicon Valley Secret. And it's part of their Mostly Human series by Lori Segal. And Paul, you tweeted this out recently uh, with the text, quote, this week I'm reminded of this video article on what happens when we attempt to put productivity over mental well-being and the item and i'll put the link it's got the video and then it's also got the transcript if you want to read it but it examines the link between entrepreneurship and depression with rand fishkin's well-known story featuring prominently rand is quoted as saying it's almost like a badge of honor to show how busy you are all these things that normal human beings do and need people need families they need to go to sleep at night but somehow that is excluded from the acceptable portion of the culture paul why is this video so important to you yeah, I think, I mean, it's a heavy, like you watch that video, it's a it's a heavy video. They talk about one guy who committed suicide. They talk about Rand struggling with mental health. Um, they talk to, I was in Jerry Colonna, who, who's written a couple books on leadership, which are actually really, really good. I think um, Jason DJ should read them. <laughs> um, I just, I, I just think that it, it's something that's overlooked in, um, in, in tech and startup culture. And I think I, just in general in business culture or in corporate culture where it's like, okay, we need to sacrifice things to get ahead in one thing. And I think that's just kind of a, a weird way to look at it where it's like, okay, well, I can, I can have a family maybe later, or if I'm feeling bad or depressed or, or however I'm feeling, I can just push that out of the way because I have to be productive. Like I have to, I have to get things done. I have to go, go, go. If you're not, 
if you're not growing, you're dying and all that kind of just like tired business advice. And I just think that the, the companies I've been, I've been working on a new season uh, of another show that I'm part of. And we, we've been talking to a lot of companies who are putting um, non profitable things first and it's it's absolutely helping them um and, and focusing on mental health and in having um stipends for um however you want to take care of your own mental health or by raising the minimum wage or or all of these things that seem like okay well how if, if the point of capitalism is profit then these things kind of go against that and how does that work and i think it it can absolutely because we're not robots like you can't just you can't just um i guess make people or hope that people just sit at their desk and, and work for eight hours a day and, and feel good about it. They're like, we're all whole people with, with, um, with issues and, and, and who are dealing with things. And it's just, and thinking about that and watching that video again, I'm just like, this is, yeah, it's not talked about that, uh, that often, but I think it's something that does need, um, focus. And Brian, it's something that's kind of been a through line for us at Unemployable, you know, which is kind of building and designing your business to serve the lifestyle that you want, not the other way around. Yeah, no, I mean, that that is definitely true. Um, you know, and I think Paul's work has contributed heavily to this as well, that business doesn't have to be insane hockey stick growth for the sake of growth. It's about living your life and living the kind of life that you want and not answering to anyone else right there. You know, everything else on top of that for me has been gravy and there's a lot of gravy, but you know, it's really about being able to do the kind of work you want to do without someone telling you what to do and expecting you to not sleep, to not see your children. It's ridiculous. This is your life. You know, you, you get one shot at it. So, but it also brought to mind some of the episodes we did, I think four or five years ago, you know, I think the uh, title was, uh, do you have to be quote unquote crazy to be an entrepreneur? Meaning, do you have to have some, you know, affliction or something you're compensating for? Because you do hear lots of stories about this. I mean, reportedly, Bill Gates is on the autism spectrum. Um, Steve Jobs was, you know, compensating for abandonment issues over being adopted or put up for adoption at birth, all these kind of things. I've had my own issues of related to the same topic. Um, but now I don't, you know, and, it, and it's weird because, you know, Jared's always trying to get salty Brian to come back, but I'm too happy to be that salty. I mean, it's, uh, it's good. And trust me, I'm not I don't really have trying it. to get that guy back. <laughs> yeah, you are. Yeah, you are. You'll do anything for ratings. Only for the faster. content, but not for the business. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, but yeah, I, I don't feel like I have anything to prove to anyone else, but I'm still driven to do new projects because they're fun. I like doing it, but like I'm driving in a school zone lately, you know, I'm not, I'm not going full blast and I'm happy because I'm still getting things done day by day, do the work that's important. You end up getting there, you get to the next launch and you get to see if you still got it. And that to me is a blast. So I think we could all adopt a healthier attitude about this. It's you're not going to avoid work. There's no such thing as get rich quick unless you bought, you know, Bitcoin a while back. Um, otherwise, it's got to be fun. It's got to fulfill a sense of purpose and, you know, fuel your life, not the other way around. All righty. Well, that is going to conclude this week's edition of Headlines. And that means that it is time for this week's main topic. And this week, we are going to continue with the themes from the past couple of weeks, building a personal enterprise and the growing trend of unretirement. And, you know, in fact, if you haven't checked out the new email series that Brian released this week that links those two together, you should. It's called Future Freedom. It's available at futurefreedom.com. Make sure that you go there and check that out. But the question is, where does building a personal brand kind of play into all of this, right? Do you need to build a personal brand to build a personal enterprise? Are they one and the same? Do you need it at the beginning in our social media conscious world, but are then able to dish it later once the demands of a personal brand are no longer necessary to serve the ends of the enterprise? Well, there aren't many people more qualified to discuss it than Brian and Paul. 
Both of them have built successful personal enterprises, each without leaning fully into the personal brand focus that so many online-based business entrepreneurs have had to focus on. So what can we learn from their example? Today, we are going to find out. So Brian, I will turn it over to you. Yeah, we're kind of like the anti-personal brand, personal brands, <laughs> um, which I guess is a strategy in itself. If we were being strategic, I'm not. I don't think you are. I think you're just being you. Yeah. Um, but anyway, the idea of the personal enterprise uh, will make sense to you, Paul. It's basically, you know, everyone kind of starts out often as a freelancer, client services. Then maybe they go into some sort of information products, courses, those type of digital uh, products. And then some people like Laura Roeder was our last case, go into software um, and you have as well. Now, what I always tell people is, you know, with this approach, you have the option of keeping what you did before in play, uh, run by others or, or somehow, uh, or you get to ditch it, especially the client part. Now, when it comes to ditching the prior stuff, you're the example right? <laughs> because because you you kind of went offline for a bit and then just kind of trashed everything because you are 100% committed to fathom and it's a worthy project it's you know software it's lucrative it's a mission uh, to enhance uh, consumer privacy uh, and getting entrepreneurs to do the right thing with their analytics solutions as well so i love it it's fantastic um, and we do have prior episodes with Paul, but let's just give a quick recap of the journey so people understand that you just didn't wake up one day and go, I'm going to start an analytics software company, right? It didn't exactly. happen that way. Fi it just fired me up so much. I'm so passionate about analytics. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's a, the whole other. I think we talked about passion on a previous episode years ago. But yeah, so I started out. Uh, as a web designer, designing for people who are at the forefront of personal brand, like they were developing personal brands before personal brands were a thing, like uh, Danielle Port Marie Forleo. Um, and I did that for a long time. I've worked for myself for 21, 22 years now. And then I was like, oh, th these, these folks are all great examples of people who are doing really well and they have a personal brand. So I'm like, maybe I'll try that. And I started to write and my writing took off a little bit and I wrote a bunch of books and I had a newsletter for I guess it was probably about eight years that I wrote the Sunday dispatches um but then I kind of started to realize and I don't I'm not smart enough to know I don't like something until I do it for a while until until I'm like in it and I, I slowly started to realize over a couple of years like I I don't want to have a public opinion like I don't want to be a known person I don't want to exist in this rat race of of like people listening to the things I have to say, like, I'm just, I'm just not interested in it. And I don't think it's bad. And I think some people do it really, really well. And some people are their personality type or who they are as humans. It suits them really well to have a, a podium in which to speak to others in which to speak to the masses. That's not me. I'm super private. I'm super awkward. I don't care if people listen. And I was talking to somebody on Twitter today. They're like, well, like, what about your legacy? Because I deleted my website. I think my website now says I used to have a personal brand and now I don't. And that's, <laughs> like, that's the website. And I'm like, I don't care. I don't care about my legacy. Like, I don't like if people forget who I am, I don't give a shit. Like, it just it doesn't it doesn't whatever it is inside people. That's like, I, I really want to make a lasting impression on others. I I don't know. I just, I, I don't have that. And so when the opportunity arose to not have, like, and unfortunately that was tied, I mean, fortunately and unfortunately that was tied to my income for probably a decade. So it's not like I could have just been like, I'm done with being Paul. I'm done with being P -Jerv. I can just leave. And no, I wouldn't like, I, I had mortgage and car payments and stuff like that. Um, so when the opportunity arose where I was like, oh, well, okay, Fathom is doing well on its own. I don't need to do this anymore. Why am I still doing it? There wasn't a good reason. So I was like, okay, I guess I'm done doing that. I'm done being a known person. But you, along the way, you created, you know, they weren't Paul the guru. They were, you know, 
brands. There was creative yeah. class. Uh, there was the MailChimp course, which yeah. was incredibly yeah. um, popular. Did sold those still exist? No, I sold oh, okay. So the good and the bad thing about all of those things, because I'm a designer um, and I really like brands, I created a brand for each of the products that I had. That's so I've been smart. able, to, yeah, I've been, I, I wasn't smart in the beginning. It was just luck. Um, I've been able to piecemeal sell off most of them now. I have sold everything other than creative class hmm. at this point. Um, I wouldn't sell them. Somebody offered to buy Sunday dispatches. So I was like, yeah, I can't sell it. Like, that's not, that's not a, that's not an asset. That was a, a, a community of folks who got my emails, but everything right. else. Yeah. I've managed to sell uh, so they can keep going. Cause I think that it, with chimp essentials specifically, I think it's really, really needed. I'm just not the person to do it. Right. So right. It, it can live on through somebody else. And luckily it wasn't like Paul Jarvis's chimp essentials. It was just like chimp essentials, MailChimp. Right. Training. So for people who don't know, chimp essentials was like, you know, if you've seen Brennan Dunn's Mastering Convert Kit, Paul thought of that first, that brand specific teach the automation, which is, you know, tricky for a lot of people to grasp. So, you know, it was a pioneering thing. I'm glad you were able to sell it. But I tell that all the time. People are like, I'm going to focus on my personal brand. I'm like, why don't you create something bigger than you and your personal brand will be just fine. <laughs> And that's my philosophy because I don't ever want, you know, you can't sell brianclark.com for anything, you know, and I keep telling people, Chris Brogan, Seth Godin, both have said in the past, that was our one mistake, you know, yeah. building on our names too much right. because uh, Godin has totally fixed that by spinning off independent brands and mm -hmm. that's smart. So anyway, there's a lesson right there. And of course, Fathom, is its own standalone brand. And I could see Paul retiring very comfortably someday if, if that's what you choose to do. Um, but it seems like, you know, of course, no one wakes up and says, I'm so passionate about analytics. But it's still, when you tie in the privacy angle, it's important to you. Yeah. And I mean, I think that, uh, I think that um, passion follows experience a lot. I think that people think, okay, well, I need to be passionate about something in order to do it. I'm just like, now nah, I'm just going to do something. If I'm passionate about it later, awesome. If I'm not, whatever, I'll try something else. So <laughs> for me, I was passionate about um, digital privacy. I didn't care. I couldn't care less about analytics. Analytics, like Google Analytics, which is still like 76% of the, the market share of like, websites on the internet 76 percent of them use google analytics i was just like this is like this is boring to me like honestly google analytics is boring it's annoying to use that's why i wanted to come up with something different and and better in in some regards and there was no niche like there was no niche market in analytics before uh i started the company with somebody else who's moved on and now I'm running it with somebody named Jack Ellis. But it's fine. There, there was really just, there were like different things like mix panel and there were different things that kind of touched on analytics, but weren't just, this is web analytics for X. So I was like, okay, well, niching has worked down for everything else I've ever done. What if I make an analytics product for people who care about digital privacy or simplicity? Like they just want to get their analytics. I don't want to study. I don't want to get a fucking certificate in knowing analytics to use an <laughs> analytics product. Like I got things to do. I don't want to spend all day doing that. Like I got a business to run. So I was like, well, what yeah. if there's other people like me? And there were. <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, Google analytics is just so impenetrable, you know? I mean, every time I would open it up and look at it, it just made my head hurt. So I've always been a fan of simple analytics. I don't know if you remember, like when I first started Copyblogger, there was this uh, analytics uh, solution called Mint. Do you remember yep. that at all? Yeah, have a yeah. Mint, Sean Inman. Mm -hmm. Right. And it was just so simple. Like these people are showing up and they did this and okay, and that's it. That's all I really needed as a content creator to go, okay, your idea over here that that would be great was not great. But this thing that you didn't expect to do well is doing well. Okay, that's just very basic stuff yep. that you can actually take action on. Yeah. Um, Fathom is so totally that's based on me loving Mint as well. He just had the wrong business model. 
That's it. Yeah. Perfect product though. Right. But, uh, but that's what drew me to fathom. Now I am also <laughs> interested in the privacy angle, but it doesn't drive me as much because as far as I'm concerned, the cow's out of the barn on, I mean, with the existence of Facebook and Amazon and Netflix and Google, I'm going to have to come up with doing some new stuff to keep it secret. But, <laughs> but generally though, I, I, I see the privacy oriented industry uh, being led right now at, at the grand scale by Apple against Facebook, uh, mm -hmm. which is warms my heart. But um, yeah, it's a real thing. So again, I would say that you kind of saw what was coming and it matched up with what Paul thinks is important. And, and that is the genesis of so many good ideas because that sense of purpose means at least when it gets rough, like if it didn't take off as well as it did, you'd be slogging it out a little bit and you'd probably go, no, I wouldn't. yeah, I, I don't it. like that. No, you'd be like, oh, I'm, I'm done. <laughs> yeah. How do you know when you want, how do, how, how do you know when it's time to do something? People ask that all the time. Um, uh, for work, if it's not making money or it's not making enough money or the margins yeah, but, aren't healthy but how, sustainable. Over what amount of time though? Yeah, that's a good question. Probably... Actually, no, it's not. It has to go, it has to do well right out of the gate. Like I look at all my courses, all my books, all the software products that I've done that have done well. Some of their best revenue months were the first month. And right. so that's that drives them. Even Fathom. Fathom wouldn't exist if it wasn't popular. Like yeah. I was sick of Google Analytics one day. I spent two hours designing what I thought an analytics product should look like. I tweeted it, went bananas. <clears throat> and I was like, okay, maybe this should be a thing. I built an open source version of it, got downloaded 1.2 million times in the first couple months. It's like, there's a market here. And it's probably just right. not nerds who know how to like set up servers and install Fathom in this version. And so we built the paid product and the paid product did pretty well. Like it was the paid product. You're right. It was a slower ramp up and Fathom's best revenue month is always whatever now is. And so the first month wasn't as profitable, but we did see that people cared enough about it that they wanted it and that they used it and that they were downloading it and that they were talking about it. And all of those things were like, okay, I'm not that excited about analytics, but I am now <laughs> like, yeah. and the, uh, the intersection <clears throat> of what I do care about privacy, it's good. And even people like, even if you don't care about privacy, um, there's a lot of privacy laws. California has pre pretty big ones, all of Europe. Um, has some pretty big privacy laws and we've invested thousands of dollars, thousands of hours, hired experts and lawyers from around the world to consult with us to make sure like, okay, if we're going to be the most law compliant and this is not exciting and I'm not passionate about this, but <clears throat> absolutely helps a business absolutely caters to the market where it's like, okay, if you want compliant analytics with GDPR or CPPA or um, PCR, uh, in the UK, then we're the best option because we put as much work as possible, or as much work as needed into building a solution that complies with these laws. And dealing with laws, privacy laws, is, isn't that fun, but it's part of, it's part of the work. And mm -hmm. I'm glad that uh, for right now, that's done. And we get to focus on things we do like, like making software at the moment. That's this week. <laughs> so, well, yeah. Yeah. Well, I think you drive home the point when you say it's got to be an instant hit or it goes, you're, that's audience, right? Mm -hmm. Because if your fans don't like something, there's no chance that other people are going to like it, right? I mean, yep. it is right there. Don't uh, create illusions for yourself. If you launch something that flops, um, you got to ditch it. <laughs> um, yeah. And I've been fortunate, you know, since the beginning of copy blogger, that's never happened because, you know, we, you, you kind of go your own way a little bit, but, but I still think you're catching signals from your audience, whether it's, but it just has to be what For Paul sure. wants to do also. Yeah. 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 And I have launched a bunch of flops that it didn't work out for my audience. And you're right. They're the, they're the easiest people to convince the people who are already paying attention to you. If you can't convince them, you don't have a chance. Yeah, like business absolutely. is hard enough. Don't give yourself more difficult things. 
And that's why you don't come up with a product idea before you have an audience. So, I mean, it's just the conventional thinking around startups, even, you know, with lean methodology, it's smarter, but the whole build an audience first somehow didn't get worked into that. And that was really our thing. Um, because I've had ideas that the audience convinced me were bad because mm -hmm. I learned things that I didn't get before. And then I've also found ideas uh, because of them. But the key is, again, uh, we've been given the benefit of a doubt on our minimum viable software products, and we were able to make them better because people had faith in us. And that that cannot be overstated, you know. But now, I guess you've, you... So let me backtrack a little bit. You said you were looking at people like Marie Forleo and saying, uh, I'm going to create a personal brand. But what you really did was was attract an audience. That's how I think of it. The personal yeah. brand part makes me uncomfortable. The audience is badass. <laughs> yeah. And that's the thing. And I think that if I was starting again today from scratch, it would be, I'm going to build an audience around an idea, not a person, me, right? Like I'm going to mm -hmm. build an audience around something that we connect over. Like if it was for Fathom, it would be, okay, I'm going to I start writing about digital privacy. I don't even care if my name is on it. Or I'm going to make videos because I'm fine to be on camera. It doesn't even have to have my name. It could just be like Fathom Guy or like Digital Privacy Man. <laughs> like it, it wouldn't have to be tied to my name. And I mean, that. so that, I guess, let me back. Yeah, I don't know if I believe in that now that I'm saying it out loud. Because I think part of what was useful for me was the fact that my audience wasn't tied to a single idea. So I could start like my mm. first book was a vegan cookbook. It was just just nut jokes. The whole like 80 pages of it was just nut jokes about um, eating plant based. And the second book was about building an online business. And the third book was about creativity. Like it people fall. And I had in between there, I had a course on a freelancing at a course on um, MailChimp at a software company that did, does a WordPress plugin for courses, like people fall. And I was like, there's not going to be any overlap, but there was, there always was overlap because people were like thinking, okay, well, I, I kind of like what this guy's take is on this thing. So maybe I would have to, maybe I would begrudgingly have to start a person, start with a personal brand again. I don't actually know, to be honest. <laughs> It's interesting to me because I, you know, I've followed you for a long time, Sunday Dispatches, but also on Twitter. And and you're, of course, hilarious on Twitter. Um, my and I wife missed doesn't you when think so, though. Uh, my wife doesn't <laughs> think I'm funny either. Um, but when you left for a while, I was bummed out. I told Jared, I'm like, Jarvis, quit Twitter. What the hell? <laughs> um, but I had a point here. Oh, um, it seems like you had very passionate supporters, but you also just pissed people off at a rate that made me look like Pollyanna. I, you know, and you would share on Twitter, like people complaining about something you'd read. I'm like, where do you find these people? Why do you think you attracted so many cranks? Um, I, I wish I knew. And I mean, to be honest, part of why I, I, digital privacy is appealing is because I've had a bunch of death threats or a bunch of like threats of violence and or people Jeez. like I'm going to dox you and shit. That's and I'm just crazy. like, crazy for what? Like, I, I don't I write <laughs> about creativity. Like, honestly, <laughs> it, it's not like I'm talking about abortion one week, then religion the next week, then left and right wing politics. The next. Like I'm writing about entrepreneurialism and creativity. Like I, I don't. Honestly, I don't understand. Somebody, yeah, in the middle of last year, I was I was talking about after um, after George Floyd was murdered, I was talking about um, race on, on my newsletter. And so somebody decided to go and ship post me on every single video on YouTube that I've ever been on, whether it was like partnerships that I had with corporations to just like interviews like this. And it's just like, Jesus, this is like, this is this is too like this is silly like this is just ridiculous that this person spent so many hours of their day like trying to make it rough for me because they disagreed with me and that's bizarre it, it's yeah i i don't i don't understand the psyche uh, of of people like that but yeah i don't even remember what the question was now <laughs> No, uh, I I still don't get what you do to piss people off. Yeah, to that exactly. level, But <laughs> I I have I have no idea. I think yeah, I don't know. I, I have ideas, but I don't know.
to be honest. I remember during the early days of copy blogger and you know, that was pre Facebook and Twitter. So social media was like dig and delicious and, and we'd make the dig homepage on purpose. Of course, that was the strategy back then. And we would get all the basement dwelling boys who would just throw the hate at us for being marketing scum like that. Yeah. That's stupid, but it wasn't awful. Yeah. You know, every, I mean, it was just, you just blocked him from the comments. <laughs> yeah. Every time we make the homepage of Hacker News, I'm just like, oh, oh, really? here it comes. <laughs> no. Because then as well, like, it, it, like my, my co-founder wants to see what people are saying and wants to like rationally engage. He's a very smart person. He's very convincing. He should probably, if he hadn't become a programmer, he probably would have become uh, a lawyer. He's very good at making compelling and convincing arguments, but it's like, that's, that's going to waste a day. Uh, yeah. I used to think that people. worked too. It doesn't. It doesn't, I mean, work. it doesn't work. No one is going to change their mind. Just don't. <laughs> exactly. I get, I get upset with myself when I forget that rule and, and actually engage, but I used to boy. Uh, yeah. I think those it's, were the it, days. it sucks too, because people are always like, well, don't let them affect you. Like don't, don't let the trolls bother you. And it's like, really? How? Like, I'm a human being. I have feelings. Like, I don't know how to, if somebody is being an awful person to me, I don't know how to not feel at least slightly awful. Like, it's not going to, it's not going to ruin my day or anything, but it's still, it's going to make me feel like shit. And if that compounds to dozens or hundreds of people doing that, and then it's like, is this even worth it? And for me, it's not. So. Yeah. And, and that's what, I guess kind of mystifies me a little. So first of all, if you're out there listening and you're scared of this type of stuff happening to you, um, it's really not that bad in most instances. Uh, and you don't want everyone to agree with you. That means you're not saying anything worth saying really. Sure. Um, but those people who intentionally go out to build a brand of them, they're either just fearless or deluded, and I'm not sure which, but I think they do a very good job of shielding themselves. I mean, any kind of celebrity in the world yeah. in this social media sphere knows not to read the comments, right? I mean, you yeah. just don't. So I I empathize with your business partner, but I, I would talk to him in, over coffee and explain to him that rationality does not work. <laughs> I th he, he's been he's starting to understand that, that. And I think part of the issue there is that, yeah, celebrities do have have things to shield themselves. And, and you're absolutely right. And that, that's absolutely important for their sanity, I think. But the problem when folks like us are starting things is in the beginning, being accessible is what helps. Right? Like yeah. in the beginning, having an email address that like 67 people knew uh, um, that were on my mailing list and they could email me and I would email them back super beneficial and word got around that, um, that, that anybody who does that it, it is good at that and good at listening, good at kind of fostering an audience and a community. But then when 40,000 people have your email address, it's not the same. And then the, the best case scenario in that is that it's volume. And like, I can't reply to every, I can't even read everybody's email. Like it got to the point where I couldn't read everybody's emails. Yeah, And I, that's part of what I liked. And I couldn't even do the things I like, like even outside of negativity. It was like, I can't do the thing that I used to like doing because my inbox is ridiculous. One thing I could never do and didn't want to do at copy blogger was let people email me directly because it was just too much. But with further, um, they do. And I encourage it. But once you get past five figures, you know, at some point you're going to have to change that email address. Yep. <laughs> and I'm dreading that because I'm getting great feedback. And the only time I got any hate was when I posted about George Floyd. <laughs> Seems to be a common thing here. Yep. Uh, but it, even that wasn't awful. It ranged from snarky to uh, condescending, but not terrible. And I just said, actually said nothing. <laughs> I didn't respond. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, the interaction is key. Being a real person, genuinely being there, you can't really um, you can't really beat that when your audience is small because that's how your audience gets big. Mm -hmm. But it's a catch twenty two because at some point 
it just becomes unmanageable. Yeah. Jared, Guys, let me hop in here. Well, well, we got a question here from Don that I think is really good and well-timed. He said, what are the conditions to transform a personal brand to a personal enterprise? You know, especially folks who maybe they're down the road already with a personal brand. You know, how do you go about that now, you know, transitioning to being more focused on the enterprise? Well, when you have the audience and you've got a new business idea, um, they're who you launch it to. And like Paul said, and I said, it either you, you're either paying attention to, to what they need and you get it right and it works. Um, and then generally, so the, here's how we did it at, during the copy blogger years where we would launch a new major product every year. You know, we would launch, uh, we would work out the bugs, optimize and start working on the next thing on the side, which I call the perpetual side hustle. And I still follow that um, procedure now. It's just the economics are different. At Copyblogger, if we launched something and didn't make seven figures a year, it was a failure. It didn't happen, but it we would have killed it in a second. The only things that were technically complete failures were our live conferences, but those were public relations. You know, I mean, it's a different set of rules to that. We did that to meet with our people and talk to them and engage. And that's that was what was so fun about me because I couldn't handle you emailing me, but I could meet you in person. And that was what those things were for. But software courses, et cetera, um, we launched a new one every year. So you can see Don as, as you know, an entrepreneur um, who launches a successive string of projects that succeed. All of a sudden you've got three to five things and you're like, Paul, you're either going to choose to sell them or like us, we sold, um, or you're going to, you know, you're going to end them or you're going to get someone else to run them. And that's really how it shakes out. Uh, in Paul's case, he got to a point with his software project that the other things weren't really interesting to him, I guess is what you would say, except for creative yeah. class, which is kind of your baby. I, I get the sense that, you know, you have that kind of kinship with it. But uh, uh, anyway, I hope that answers your question, Don. Paul, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I think in terms of conditions to transform a brand into an enterprise, it's commerce, I think. And, and for commerce to work, <laughs> oh, yeah. it has to, you have to, you have to think about the economics of it, right? Like, if your audience is 100 people, and you're charging $10 for thing the the unit, the economics there aren't going to work. Right. So when your audience is small, you need to think about, okay, well, how can I sell bigger ticket items to them? Because my audience is small. When I was a web designer, I needed 10 or 11 people to hire me a year. Like that, that was it. That, that was me making well into six figures because that was the way that it worked. But as my audience grew, I was like, okay, I can sell cheaper things. And they don't, they're not cheap, but the, the cost of them is less because right. the economics is there. I can't sell a $10 book unless 100,000 people buy it. Right. Or I can't have a I can't have a publishing deal unless a lot of hundreds of thousands of people buy it because I'm making nothing from it because publishing is garbage. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us how you really feel, Paul. Come on. Exactly. I'm not doing any more books, so I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> my, my publisher um, and agent already know that. So you ditched your email list, but you kept your Twitter account. Why? Uh, partly because of contractual obligations I have uh, currently, but also I I feel like, and I'm probably just delusional here to be honest, but I feel like Twitter is never really where I did any brand building. I've always just kind of been on there and talked to my friends. And yeah. I, that's my, my friends are digital, especially in the last year and a half. I, that's all I have. Brian, don't take that away from me. <laughs> I wouldn't take it. I'm. That's the only platform I've got left. I've like yeah. deleted everything else. But Same, speaking of but Twitter, you got a interesting compliment here. Let me read it to you on Twitter. Really enjoy talking with the fine crew at Fathom. Privacy is a central aspect of computing is still in many ways in its infancy. Many of the proponents and evangelists can come off sounding like dreamers and hippies. But we need to dream a better world before we can make it. Now, stellar testimonial there, except that DHH of Basecamp said it. And I think his stock has gone down, but it's still a nice yeah. sentiment, right? Yeah. I mean, that was 
that was the week before everything imploded. <laughs> there. I know. And we like we had him on our show and it was yeah. I mean, we de- we deleted that interview from our show too. So it didn't feel like giving him a wow. platform. Yeah. Yeah. I've never done that. That's the first time I've ever and I've been podcasting for a very for a long long time. It's the first time I've ever deleted an episode. But I talked about it with Jack, my co-founder, and we we're like we don't really we don't really need to share this and it's funny too because we were getting customers who said oh we listened to your interview with dhh and and have signed up and i'm like i don't feel like i that doesn't make me feel good and so i was just like fuck it it's out there like nothing on the internet ever goes away fully understand right. that just like, even my blog people are like well you do i can't read your blog i'm like you can a hundred percent find everything i've ever written on the internet if you try hard enough, it's there. <laughs> Even if you don't try, like if you just go to Wayback Machine, you can find everything. You can find things I was writing in the '90s. That nobody needs to read because they were awfully written. I'm curious about that, Paul. So you got rid of the website. Have there been any unintended consequences of trying to kind of put the toothpaste back in the tube with your personal brand that maybe you didn't anticipate or that you would do differently? Yeah, Fathom Tech Support blows up with people trying to get in touch with me personally. Mm. That's not the, I that's saw not you the tweet about story. that. He literally wrote, don't contact Fathom Support to talk to me. <laughs> it's on the website. It's on, it's on yeah. my website. It's so, <laughs> so I even went so far as to put on my Twitter, I don't know if it's still there, but I put works at Fathom because like, I don't care if people know that I like, I, it's not important to me to be a co-founder of anything. I just, I don't care. But I'm like, maybe if people just think I'm an employee somewhere. They'll be gentler on tech support because like, Jack does tech support as well. I don't want, like, that's not what this is. That's not what a tech support is for. It's not for getting in touch with me to, to talk to me. If you can't get in touch with me, there's a reason. You don't need to. Like, honestly, you, nobody needs to get in touch with me anymore. So It's on my calendar later. Hit up Paul at Fathom. <laughs> I'm a customer, damn it. You will take you, my yeah, support that's right. ticket. It's, it's within your right. <laughs> Send a complaint, and then a couple of messages later, go into the into yeah. the real question. I, the problem is it always works just fine, so I don't yeah. really have <laughs> anything to say. So anyway, that's why we had him on the show for a winning third time. Uh, never a letdown, speaking with Paul Jarvis. Do we have any other questions? Jared, did you have anything? We do. Well, I have one other question too for you, Paul. You know, you said earlier, you know, you're not concerned about your legacy, you know, anything like that. So I guess, you know, one question that people may have is then why are you doing this podcast? Why do you do the other podcast that you do? Is that strictly, you know, I'm getting out in my role at Fathom to market and to get the word out? Or is there something else driving that? True story. He told me no at first. I had to go, Paul, (laughs) come on. I don't do interviews anymore. (laughs) So, except I think I've made two exceptions, which seems like a lot. But I think last year I did about 150. The year before I did about 300. So doing two wow. is a is is a, a drastic. But yeah, it's I my job is still like my my role as whatever my role is at Fathom is to market and design the software. I know, like, I have a fancy microphone. What am I supposed to do with it? Except do a couple (laughs) podcasts, except do my own. And I think that the point of the Fathom show is that it's it's not about Paul Jarvis. It's not the Paul Jarvis show who works at Fathom. It's to talk about the the things that we talk about. And I'm I'm not the star of that. Same with the show that I host for MailChimp, Call Paul. The people that I interview are the stars of that show, not me. I'm not. I'm not interested in being the star of anything. Yeah. So, but I still like. Like I like talking to you, Brian. I like talking to you, Jared. Like, I like these kind of things will happen, but it's not something that I want to be doing. Like I was the year that Company of One came out. I was doing at least two or three interviews a week, and that was like that's a lot. That's a lot. Yeah. That's way too. That's way too much. So. So, so the personal brand part is, you know, cause just, just to make sure that people are clear on it, you know, personal brand is you've got a website attached to your name. You're building this thing around your name, mm-hmm. but just because you're not doing that intentionally, it doesn't mean that you may not be out front. You may be on a podcast, your face may be out there, but you're not making it about yourself. You're making it about, as you said, you know, I think you had a great line earlier, you know, build an idea around an audience, not a person. So it's mm-hmm. not, if you're not focused on a personal brand, it's not that you aren't necessarily out there but there's just kind of a different context that you're doing it in. 
yeah, I mean, I'm not good at that many things, but I can yeah. talk. So <laughs> I, can, I mean, I can, you can imagine as Fathom continues to grow that Paul will hire a, another face of the company. I mean, that's certainly an option. It maybe. could. Yeah. Uh, I mean, th this last this last week with all the base camp stuff has just taught Jack and I so much that I, I think you should introduce that audience. privacy guy and he's just shrouded and it's you with exactly. like a voice box. Aren't right. you just, aren't, aren't you making my face just pixels? <laughs> Every tattoo is a pixel. Whoops. <laughs> We're live on YouTube Darn and we forgot oh, to God. do that. <laughs> Darn. <laughs> Oh, I should have turned right. my backlighting on or something. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, so we did have a couple questions submitted by community members, and I want to get to them because I think they're great sure. questions. Uh, so here's one from Marcy. I'd love to know what the key differences are between personal enterprise and personal branding for you. It's not something I've really thought about much for my business. So we've touched on this a little bit, but is there anything else that we haven't talked about that you would add here? I think they're just words. Like I, I think to me, enterprise means making money, brand doesn't necessarily like there's tons of broke youtubers who have huge audiences yeah right so i and one doesn't always translate into the other i think it's important to to know like just because well, my favorite youtubers post videos of their otters this is japanese couple with these two otters and they're the best videos ever i don't like i would never go buy like i don't think i don't know they might i don't even know if they sell anything because i don't care i just want to watch their videos so i think it, it's one thing to build a brand and be popular but it's another thing to build a brand with the intention of, okay, I want to make money from this community that I'm, that I'm creating and fostering. So what steps can I do to, to accomplish that? So I think, especially with humor or animal videos, I think that the path to monetization is ads. Uh, everyone well, thinks that they got to they gotta be <laughs> Gary V to build a business and you don't. Some of the richest people I know, you don't know them because they are behind the scenes. They build websites. They do project after project. They have vast personal enterprises, but you don't know who they are. And I wish I would have started that way, but here we are. And yeah. I got Paul on the show, so he's coming down with me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, some of the, the people that I know who have the most wealth are nobody knows who they are. And they were yeah. smart and deliberate in doing things that way. So. Seems like Paul's trying to get there. Soon yeah, we will go. Be. Paul, who? Who was like, that guy? Yes. Well, somebody <laughs> on Twitter. It's funny on Twitter. Somebody was like, "Thanks to Jack and team for building Fathom," and I was like, "Yeah, yes. yeah." <laughs> <laughs> I win. That's oh, that's great. great. <sighs> that's an All odd right. goal, but good. More power to you. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay, one more question here. This is from Michael. Given his recent focus on privacy, how would Paul build an email list without tracking, but also clean his list so that he isn't paying for people who aren't opening his emails? Uh, and Michael goes on here. He says, would he move to something like Amazon SES and Sendy.co since they charge by email sent? Curious how he is doing this at Fathom. MailChimp gets expensive when you don't clean your list, but it integrates with a lot of other services. Sendy requires Zapier for integration to most other services. So how would you do that, Paul? Yeah, I mean, I was so there, there isn't really a good answer to that because I did I got rid of spy tracking pixels um, a while before I killed my mailing list. So I think the way that I would do and we don't use email for Fathom. We're probably going to in the future, but that's not been a marketing channel for us. But the way that and I've thought about this a lot because I was running a course on MailChimp. So I've thought about this very specific <laughs> problem a lot. I would take out track. I would take out tracking. I would take out the the invisible spy pixel from every email that I ever sent because that's the best privacy. But what I would do is have click tracking for an occasional email. Like once a year, I'd be like, hey, you want to stay on this list? Click this link and you'll stay on this list. The attrition from that email will be huge because most people if they're on your list, they d not everybody reads. Like if you have an open rate or a click rate of 50%, you're the smartest marketer I've ever heard of. Like it's just, that just doesn't happen that often. Right. So, but I, that, that's what I would do. I would turn off all tracking for every email once a year, send out an email it doesn't have a, a tracking pixel, but that has link tracking enabled. You can do this in MailChimp. I've tried it and say, if you want to stay on this list, click here to stay on this list. Guarantee your list will shrink by at least half. <laughs> But that's, that's the way I would do it, I think, Michael. Mm. Here's a funny story, truth, true story. Um, 
Jared, you remember this. So when you sent out that Sunday dispatch that said you weren't going to track open rates anymore, Jared and I disagreed with you on this show, <laughs> you know, nicely. We did not call you all sorts That's of names and, and dox you, um, you know, because basically our, it was just like, look, I look at open rates in the aggregate. I don't look at individual people. I don't. In my mind, that's not an invasion of privacy, whatever. But here's the funny part. The next day after that episode aired, you quit Twitter. And I'm like, Jared, <laughs> we, we offended Paul so much he quit Twitter. What are we going to do? It takes a lot to offend me, but disagreeing with, <laughs> disagreeing with me is No, bad. I know. I know. That's, Jared was like, really? And I'm like, no, Jared. I'm just... <laughs> So this is the real reason why I said no to you at first. Just step one. Yeah, that was it. You're like, <laughs> I'll teach you to disagree with me, boy. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, like, that's the thing. Like, I don't, I, I wouldn't think less of anybody for putting those pixels in a newsletter. That people expect them in a newsletter. I think worse yeah. is when you have them in your one-on-one -on -one emails to people. I think not oh. everybody knows that. Yeah, the, the cold emails where they're like yeah. clearly tracking. I open everything to delete it. So they think I read it and I'm like, no, I didn't. And I hate you more now. I run all those tracking pixels through a proxy. So people think I'm somewhere else in the world. I love <laughs> it when I get targeted ads for like Romania. I'm like, whatever I'm doing for privacy is working. <laughs> working. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> Well, thank you for coming out of seclusion for us, Paul. You mm -hmm. did have to retain your most frequent guest crown. Yes. And uh, so no more books. We we will not have a follow-up to Company of One, I guess. Yeah. By the way, you may not have wanted a legacy, but you have a yeah, legacy. Yeah, I know. I, that's, most, that's just how it works. Most frequent guest. So. <laughs> An actual example of irony, Alanis. <laughs> And by the way, Paul, this is usually the point in the show where we list out like all the places where people can connect with you. Um, you know, there's like Twitter accounts, contact this person by email. So I've got usefathom.com. Is there anything else that you'd like to promote? Perfect. No. <laughs> Guessing not. <laughs> That's it. I'm good. That's it was a it. pleasure to talk to you both. We can leave it at that. That is awesome. That is Thanks, awesome. Paul. Cool. Yep. Thank Cheers, you, Paul. Guys. All righty. And with that, we thank you all for listening. May your profits be big while your headaches stay small. And as Brian always says, keep going. Go outside. You need All a new right. sound bite. I think you need a spader sound Go bite walk. at the end. Of spader sound bites are coming. <laughs> Don't worry. They're coming. They are coming. All right. No, but.